welcome alumni, anybody that's out there in cyber world here, um, to the Cup of Joe. And I, I, I'm so excited that we have a really special, a special guest with us today. Um, and that is our own president, President Scott Green. Um, and we have an hour with Scott today, which is great. And the format for this um, might be a little different. If you've been on a cup of Joe before, um, how how we uh, will will run the show is we already have several questions that have come into us, and um, we will um, answer, ask those of Scott, and then we'll um, continue going through the questions that you might have that you can post in the Q A box that's available at the bottom of your screen. And we are going to do our very best to get through all the questions, but again, it's only an hour. The good news is we plan on posting the recording to this. Um, you can look for um, an email uh, in your inbox that we will be responding to all of you with a link to a YouTube site, but then we'll also probably also make sure we reference it um, in a future vibe for those that couldn't um, participate that will want to see it and, um, and uh, listen to all the great things that Scott has to share with us. So I hope that um, kind of explains those um, different logistics that we have with this particular webinar. Thank you to Sandy Larson, of course, and um, to our our wonderful IT team um, for helping us set this up. So with that, I would like to introduce to um, all of you um, our president, Scott Green, who took the office uh, as our 19th president on July 1st, 2019. My how time flies when we're having fun. Indeed. Um, he is a very highly accomplished executive. He's had a very accomplished career in global finance, in operations administration, and of course, most importantly, on this cup of Joe, uh, is he's a proud alumnus of the university, and he graduated in 1984 um, with a bachelor's of science in accounting. Um, he was born in Moscow, and um, Graduated from Boise High School, so he's definitely an Idaho native and it's been great to have him back. Um, he went on to attend Harvard Business uh, School and received a Master's of Business Administration in 1989. It's really fun to kind of uh, re-review his, um, his background because I, and he does uh, work for, uh, he worked at one point um, for Boise Cascade and then um, just things took off from there, which is fantastic. He worked for global law firms um, as the CEO of Pepper Hamilton and as an executive director for Wil Wilmer Hale. And he recently served before coming here as the chief operating financial officer for Hogan Lovells, one of the largest law firms in the world, uh, which has over $2 billion in revenue. He led all the firm's worldwide operations um, with conflicts of finance functions and also the technology component and responsible for over 3,000 employees. So quite an accomplished background. He's the first non-lawyer to run an American law lawyer, a uh, hundred law firm. And he was recognized as one of the top five, 50 big law innovators of the last 50 years by the American Lawyer Magazine in 2013. So I could keep going and going and going, but I am going to stop because we're going to run out of time pretty soon. Um, Scott, thank you for joining us for the Cup of Joe. And I'd like to just start with any opening remarks that you want to mention, and then we're going to dive into some of these great questions that have come our way. Yeah, thanks, Sammy. Uh, I'll just start by saying thank you for having me and thank you for, you know, it looks like we have over 100 uh, alumni uh, participants already, uh, and and uh, you're just doing a great job. I'm so glad you're with us as well. Uh, we've got a great team here at the U of I, and we've really built a strong, uh, you know, uh, management team. And, and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished over the past four years. Wonderful. Well, I'm just going to hit hit the ground running with a, a question, a couple questions that have came in tied to the University of Phoenix. It happens to be. There's a lot of coverage in the news, of course, and um, many, many of us are incredibly excited because we we have certainly um, learned a lot about this opportunity. Can you kind of give us some background on um, and share with the alumni um, ab about the University of Phoenix opportunity and 
how can our alumni um, learn more and show their support for this? Yeah, so I, I you know, I, I'm sure everybody's aware of this, but uh, for those who are not, maybe maybe I could just start by by indicating why why we are interested in it and and what are the strategic benefits of of the the transaction and it basically we were approached um you know in in you know uh early february or or, or thereabouts um you know uh from some folks who were involved uh you know peripherally with uh uh you know the university of phoenix and and the transaction that they were trying to um trying to close with uh, uh with the university of arkansas and uh you know we learned that um, that 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 transaction, uh, you know, they weren't sure if they were going to get that through. Um, if it didn't go, if we'd be interested, um, you know, and uh, you know, we said, well, we possibly would be, but you know, we didn't want to be used to just to you know push up a price or, or you know, uh, you know, be used as a stalking horse for somebody else. Um, but having said that, you know, they were very upfront with us and said, look, you know, there's a lot of interest in this, and we have other competition, and and um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, if you're interested, we will go through the process and, and, uh, you know, see where we are and, 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 you know, so we talked to them and, and when things got to a point where we were pretty, you know, we thought that it was a pretty good opportunity for us. They shared some information, uh, it's basically management information, but it wasn't detailed information. Um, we indicated we we're interested and they were interested in us because we had a chance to meet with them. Uh, we had a chance to meet with their management team and we were just really impressed with them. Uh, so then we we began doing our due diligence, and that's when things got really interesting. Uh, uh, you know, strategically, this just makes a lot of sense for us. The um, uh, the University of Phoenix they they have focused on they're primarily online, and they focused on adult learners, and that's probably the largest category of uh, of educational opportunity in the United States. Um, uh, and it's particularly interesting at this time because we are about to enter. Um, what we call an enrollment cliff, and that enrollment cliff is purely demographic. It has to do with the Great Recession of two thousand began in two thousand eight, two thousand and nine, and families started having fewer children. And so, if if you you know fast forward eighteen years, you realize that those those cohorts, that cohort, those those uh, uh, folks uh, who were you know who were born then now are ready to enter college. Well, it's a much smaller population because of the baby bust. Um, uh, some say it's 15 percent, possibly 500,000 students that uh, that will disappear from colleges, college campuses across the country, and uh, so that that's going to be a real problem for um, colleges and universities such as such as the U of I. Many predict many colleges across the country won't make it and and will be closing down. And frankly, this year I understand there's already been over 90 colleges that have closed down in this country. We're not even in the in the cliff yet, so. You know, there's just a lot of capacity in the country, and 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 we're about to see supply dry up. Having said that, um, the adult learner co cohort that the University of Phoenix serves uh, will be growing over that period of time, about five percent a year, uh, uh, according to um, you know to to many uh, who follow such things. So you know, I think it's pretty obvious that if you've got you know, one market that's shrinking and the other that's growing, that those revenues can help offset each other and mitigate mitigate uh, some of the losses, the expected losses. So, you know, from a strategic standpoint, that really piqued our interest. Also, you know, it's frankly quite a good deal for the University of Phoenix and for the University of Idaho. The University of Phoenix is a for-profit um, educational entity at the moment. And that that's come with a lot of baggage for them. Uh, they would like to be a non nonprofit, and we provide an opportunity for them to become that. And and that is very significant because that means that all the taxes that they're paying, they'll pay about twenty million dollars in taxes this year, and all the dividends that they've been paying, which has been tens of millions of dollars uh, a year, um, will now be available to both the University of Phoenix and the University of Idaho for student success. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, it's a good deal for both of us. And the not-for-profit we're setting up will acquire this at less than two and a half times EBITDA. So all those accountants and business people out there, they'll probably salivate at hearing that. I mean, how many deals have you know? Do you know that have been uh, that have been transacted at that price? So um, it's just a it's just a great fit from both uh, you know strategic and, and financial 
point of view. And then I'd also just mention, you know, that our systems are world class, and we'd be acquiring those systems and have, and make those available for for um, student success at Idaho in the state of Idaho. Um, we can leverage their platforms for you know our our on campus students and and rural rural placed uh, citizens. Um, so uh, there's just a lot of benefits. I could go on and on, but you know that kind of gives you the reason of why we we thought we were you know this would be really good for us. How can you? Um, how can you help us? I think is kind of where your your question started. You know, I would say, you know, let your legislator legislators know that you support this. Uh, this makes perfect sense for the state of Idaho. We are a very rural state, and this will give us the University of Idaho an opportunity to help reach those citizens. Uh, if you believe like I do about this, write letters of support. Um, you know, for this, uh, whether it's in op eds or or to our elected officials, and and. At a minimum, let's just be vocal about your support to others in our community. Oftentimes, the silent majority goes unheard. Um, and there, in my view, there's a very small number of people who are against this, but they're very loud. And and uh, so it'd be, it's always helpful to have the support of our alumni and, and let our legislators know how much uh, we care about, about our university and about this opportunity for our university. Well, thank you. I've met thousands of our alumni. Um, and one of the things that they do often ask about is opportunities for adult learning. And so I know that indeed resonates um, for alumni everywhere. So that that definitely excites me. And I know that people will be standing by to see where those opportunities take them. Um, on the legislative front, one of the questions is, um, how is your, how, what, how are you seeing the support so far from the legislators and other state leaders um, regarding um, this University of Phoenix opportunity? Yeah, so, you know, we appreciate our legislature, legislators and other state leaders that have listened, and we believe most now are seeing the opportunities of the partnership, uh, President Lynn and, and, um, and uh, John Wood uh, and the rest of his leadership team have gone on to, um, you know, around and met with most of our legislators. Um, and I think that's gone very well. They've had a real impact. They see that these are people who really care about their students. Um, they, they are not really, they, they don't fit the mold of what you hear about in the press. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that's gone a long way to helping us. There will always be some this politically who are, who are trying to get elected and improve themselves and put themselves above what's good for the state that will, continue to challenge us and we know that and uh, but but you know at the end of the day most legislators want to do what's right for the state and I think that they will um, see the opportunity here and 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 you know help move us forward good thank you and just a reminder some of you joined a little later after we started um, there is a QA function at the bottom of your screen or on your screen where you can type in your questions and we will try our best to get to those. So thank you for um, for putting those questions in there. So um, can you explain the timeline um, and the next steps for this affiliation with University of Phoenix? Yeah, so um, basically we, uh, we've we gone through the accreditor review. Uh, we went down to the University of Phoenix for that review. We may, met with um, the Higher Learning Commission, who's their accreditors, who are actually very tough creditors, uh, you know, um, you know, they're known as, as being very stringent, um, but uh, they're quite good. And, and I think that that went quite well. Um, uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, um, they, they will end up meeting with their board. I think it's November 2nd is the date. And should we get the green light there, um, then uh, then we, we would be prepared to go to the public market and float bonds in uh, in January. Thanks for the thanks for the timeline on that. Um, so the upcoming legislative session, um, we all start thinking about it about right now, although it starts in January. Last year, there were a lot of alumni that jumped in and really paid attention to the higher education. They wanted to make sure Idaho U of I was doing just fine, um, but by uh, the funding initiatives, along with an initiative called the Launch Initiative, which really is to help attract students to higher education. And there was a lot of focus on CTE. Um, are there other University of Idaho initiatives that you can think of coming up um, that would require legislative support this next session? 
Well, we continue to focus on cybersecurity and healthcare in the state, and you know, uh, we we continue to work with the governor's office to try to uh, include lines for those areas. They're both incredibly important areas for our state. We don't have enough um, healthcare workers in the state. We don't have enough cybersecurity experts in the state, um, and there's plenty of room for all universities to be involved in this. So, uh, we we're going to continue to to focus on those areas with the legislature and the governor. Uh, going forward. Good to know. Well, we'll stay tuned and, and we'll rally the troops if, um, if alumni support is needed to to take care of some of those important initiatives that you talk, talked about. Um, in addition to the University of Phoenix opportunity, what other initiatives is the University of Idaho taking on to help mitigate impacts from the enrollment cliff that you explained to us? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's one I've uh, I've been thinking a lot about over the years uh, since I start t- took this job. Um, and I think any president, frankly, who's not thinking about that for their institution is not doing their job. I think the best thing that we can do for the enrollment cliff is having our fan- financial house in order. I think which which we've done. Uh, this was our fourth year where we've recorded a surplus. Um, it was a small one, but we'll take it. Um, we also have set new um, grant award records uh, for research. And those awards come with uh, F&A um, uh, uh, possibilities with them, which these are, you know, the grants uh, actually cover some of our fixed costs, in other words. Uh, uh, so, you know, if we're currently covering those fixed costs with other funds, that frees up those monies to go elsewhere. So we've got some record um, uh, record uh, research grants that we've won. We've been very public about that, including one which which will start this year, which is a fifty five million dollar grant for climate smart agriculture in the state. So, uh, you know, our team's really doing a great job on that. And I'd also say that you know, getting you know, raising money to lower the cost of uh, of attendance for our students uh, through scholarships and and for endowing our professors to keep them in place and keep them paid. Um, and we've raised four hundred million of our five hundred million dollar goal so far. So we're doing really well uh, on those fronts. And then finally, just making sure that we're at full capacity with enrollment when we go into the cliff, so we we can sustain at least for the first four years. Um, you know, you know, with as full capacity as possible, and and we're getting there. Um, our, uh, our pandemic class is our seniors this year. Um, so if we have another good recruiting year like this year. Um, and the year before, uh, we will be in really good shape, I think, heading into the cliff. That's great. Um, we, uh, we do have some questions rolling in and since, uh, before we, uh, venture out of the discussion of Phoenix, I do have a couple of questions that come in on, on the University of Phoenix. Um, this, uh, alum said, I live in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm familiar with the University of Phoenix. I'm also familiar with the risks the University of Arizona is facing regarding acquisition a former Ashford. Can you explain what risks, if any, are to the University of Idaho? Yeah. So the way we structured this is much different than Ashford was structured with Arizona. Um, uh, and and uh, basically, we're structuring this nonprofit so that it is what we call a clean break. And that means the sellers will not have any further um, a role in the institution uh, once they sell it. Um, and it's also going to be set up with its own independent board. Um, uh, so the University of Idaho Board of Regents will be the sole member. The University of Idaho will have an affiliation agreement with the University of Phoenix, but it will have its own independent board and will be overseeing um, that operation. So that's very different than than what um, Ashford had. Um, and also because it is an independent um, organization and, and it's its own legal entity, it does protect us from uh, from you know prior Title IV issues, and should the University of Phoenix have fi- financial problems, it's highly unlikely. Uh, they have a very robust process. We're very comfortable with it. I don't th- see them having the same problems, despite what some U.S. senators think and and uh, issues of the past. Um, they've got a great management team, and and uh, their processes, you know, are are very very good around student loans and those sorts of things. So. Um, uh, having said that, if they do have issues, um, $200 million is being left on the balance sheet by the seller. Uh, that was part of our negotiation. Um, that could be used for working capital or contingent liabilities of any kind um, that may be out there. 
Um, uh, so, you know, first of all, I think that it's, you know, the University of Phoenix is, uh, is in a better position than Ashford was uh, on student loans. Um, I don't think they've had one that, that's been, re been by the Department of Education has been put back to them. Uh, at this point, um, doesn't mean there won't be any in the future, but there hasn't been any so far. And, uh, you know, they want to do the right things. They do a lot of training with their people and dealing with their students. So, um, you know, my, my view is that we're in a very different place and a very different structure, uh, than, than the Arizona, uh, Ashford deal. Thank you. And then there's a question as why does a merger help the University of Phoenix become a nonprofit? Why can't it University of Phoenix do this without the University of Idaho or another party? Well, I mean, how would they do it? They right now they're owned by a, um, a private equity firm, and the private equity firm's just not going to, I think, turn them over for free. Their options are either, um, you know, go back and and. And they used to be a public company, you know, with with stock out there. They could go back to to doing that, and probably get a much better price, probably a lot more than what 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 uh, the transaction that we're doing uh, with them. But you know that that takes them back to where they were and, and creates a problem of this quarterly pressure for uh, returns for your shareholders, right? Um, so it doesn't really leave them in a better place. Uh, so. Uh, you know, affiliating with the U of I and becoming a nonprofit, um, you know, with the U of I uh, is a better solution and, and one that they've actually wanted to, um, that they've been pursuing for a number of years, that they've agreed with their private equity firm. That's that's the exit that they would like. Um, and the reason for that is it aligns them with their educational mission rather than having to please shareholders or investors um, they can focus on student success. And by being a not-for-profit, they don't have to pay taxes. They can invest, reinvest that in student success. And they found a great partner with the U of I. And we're, we've done our due diligence, and, and these are good people who, who want to do the right thing. Um, so, you know, uh, we believe that we will be a solution for them, and we can help them, um, you know, by not only becoming a not-for-profit, but by working on pathways between our two institutions that, that will, you know, benefit us both. Thank you. I have one more and then I'm going to go on. We might circle back to Phoenix. Um, we have time. But what collaborative opportunities do you foresee for adult education consultants? We might have a few of those that are alumni that are asking that question. Well, you know, again, I think there's always a, a need for service providers. Um, I don't know what kind of educating education consulting he's talking about. Um, you know, we have everything from, and, and the University of Phoenix has everything from, um, you know, folks who, you know, regulatory consultants to, uh, to um, uh, you know, instructors who, who are part-time instructors or consultants um, uh, to, to, you know, labor. I mean, we, we use more consultants they can shake a stick at. So my guess is, you know, especially as, as uh, the private, private universities, uh, which I think are going to become a thing of the past. I just think there's so much government focus on them and, and the government doesn't like them that at some point they either need to find a partner or they, they won't survive. Um, so there probably is opportunities there for consultants to get out there and help these universities find a partner and, and get them integrated. Um, so those are the opportunities that I, I see. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move into another topic that's very exciting to people, but can you give us an update on reaching R1 um, status and um, what does that mean financially for the institution if we do make it to the R1 status? Sure. So just so folks who may not know what R1 is or what we're talking about is the Carnegie, um, uh, there's a Carnegie classification for research institutions and R1 is the highest um you know, most intensive research type of institution. And you say, well, why is that important to be ranked, you know, among that group? We're R2 currently. We're very high research, but we're not the highest, but very high. And then, um, you know, so why would we want to be R1? Well, about 80% of federal dollars go to R1 institutions and some of the best uh, research opportunities go there. And, and, and R1 institutions are, you know, better attract, you know, quality faculty to conduct research and, and, uh, that that students are interested in and that benefit the state and the nation. So um, we've always pushed above our weight. 
you know, we're building a world-class Ecotron facility that's going to be the envy of any institution across the country or the world. Uh, we're building the largest research dairy uh, in the state of Idaho because we're the third largest dairy producing state uh, in the in the country. Um, you know, uh, climate smart agriculture, um, you know, uh, things around, you know, research around fire, um, you, you name it. Uh, you know, we do a lot of this stuff and it's applied. It's stuff that matters to Idaho. It's stuff that matters to the country. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's important to us. Um, we are doing a great job of getting there. We set a record last year of nearly $116 million in research expenditures. Uh, we're on pace to surpass that this year. We brought in a, a ton of doctoral students um, and, and support for our postdocs, which you know creates the staff to bolster our research bandwidth. Uh, so the R1 goal is a bit of a moving target. Uh, there's this company, there's this entity called ACE, um, that has bought the Carnegie system, um, and they may make some changes to it, but um, the reality is that we're almost there, you know, from both an expenditure and and a support uh, point of view in the in the way they measure these things. Um, you know, we we're, you know we should be there to to hit it by 2025 if they don't make too many changes to the system um, that that would move us out for some reason. But uh, right now we're doing really well. And by the way, we're we're in a virtuous circle, you know, because with these research awards comes F and A, like I talked about earlier, and it just makes the university a healthier place. And over half of our undergraduate students get to do research, and that's unusual for any institution across the country. So that's why our students, when they come out, they're ready to go to work because they've been working on cutting edge research, and they know what they're doing, and they command the highest starting salaries of any public of any other public university in the state. So we're 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 doing a real service for the state of Idaho and and for our country with the research we're, we're conducting. That's great. There is t a ton of great energy here at the Moscow campus, and I know lots of people are excited about moving up to R1. Um, but can you also share maybe plans and vision for the other uh, campuses that in Idaho Falls, in Boise, in Coeur d'Alene? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Can you share some of the plans and vision for the other three campuses sure. in Coeur d'Alene? Yes, sorry. Idaho Falls, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So ultimately, you know, we want to um, carry out our land grant mission throughout all of our campuses and extension sites across, across Idaho. And for our campuses, we're aiming to cater to programs to the needs of their respective communities. You know, in Coeur d'Alene, uh, we have a, an incredible um, faculty that focus on industrial robot ro robotics. Um, we also have those who focus on programs in natural resources, been business and engineering. Uh, in Idaho Falls, it won't surprise you that we're we're focused and you know Amy used to work there and uh, be be a, a real help to us there. That uh, we're focused on nuclear engineering programs and cybersecurity uh, in building our partnership with the Idaho National Laboratory there. And in Boise, we've been specializing in education, natural resources, law, architecture, and engineering. And also, we've been building out our our, our professional education, you know, um, uh, there as well. Uh, most recently, working with um, uh, the West Data School District to uh, to provide professional development programs for uh, those um, administrators who would like to become superintendents, and and that's just been an incredibly successful program. So those are kind of the plans, you know, or what we focus on. Uh, we want to expand those in, in each of those areas. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, in, in all three of those markets. Uh, and so it's, I can't really put one above the other. Um, I am most concerned about North Idaho right now uh, and Coeur d'Alene, given what's going on at NIC. Um, uh, they've been a great partner w with us and a great future school and, and um you know, we may have to, you know, by default, invest a lot more money out there if, if, uh, if you know, the assault on NIC continues. So uh, we just keep watching that. Right. Uh, this is a comment or question from um, one of our alum in the chat. Seems like the universities in the state are working together better than in the past. What opportunities might be available for co uh, cooperating to further uh, all higher education in the state. So how can you see the universities working together to continue to help? Well, there's got to be a will to do that. And, you know, we're fortunate that we, we've been 
doing a lot of great collaborative work with um, ISU. Uh, Kevin sadly has been terrific and been really open, and we've done a lot together in cybersecurity and nuclear engineering. We've we both have put together joint lines uh, and and grants and and won them. Um, you know, uh, both through our federal delegation and and our state. Um, so we've done a lot of really good work together. And I would say we've done a lot of good work with CWI as well. Um, uh, the, our, our jumpstart program down in the treasure Valley is an example of that. Um, you know, uh, uh, we, we, uh, you know, we want to provide, you know, at least to our students there and, and to dual credit, to provide them the opportunity to, to get, uh, you know, uh, get a head start on getting off to college and, and the U of I in particular. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a service to the treasure Valley, um, in that respect. So those are great partnerships. Um, and we've always had a great partnership and collaboration with, with NIC, uh, it, for some of the others, it's tough, you know, uh, you know, collaboration only works if both parties can win and, and not everyone thinks that way. So, uh, I really worry Kevin Satterley is, is retiring at the end of the year. I just hope that, um, they, that the new ISU president is open and as good a, of a collaborator and as good of a person as, as Kevin's been for us. Wonderful. And and a question also related to community colleges. It appears that there's a lot of more partnership also between U of I and community college. And I didn't know if you wanted to comment anything on that as well. I'm sorry. Um, partnerships with community colleges as well. Well, I, I think I just spoke to it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, we we can do two plus two programs. Um, mm -hmm. Frankly, our hands are a bit tied. Uh, we we are not allowed to do um, you know four year programs uh, other you know according to policy three Z outside of our service region. So um, that that kind of limits what we can do with with some of the the two year um, institutions outside of NIC, but. Um, but we do like to do the two plus twos wherever we can and, and where there's ROI. But, you know, we have to have enough um, enough students and enough um, scale and to, to actually do well with those programs and, and, to, and to coordinate with those community colleges. And, and we struggle with some policy issues right now to, to make that, that pay. Thank you. Um, so... There is this brave and bold campaign that's happening. Um, can you give a quick update on how how University of Idaho is doing on on this brave and bold campaign? Yeah, I think we're doing. I think we're doing incredible. Like I mentioned it earlier. I mean, we set a goal. Of, you know, when I got here, of, of half a billion dollars, and I think people fell out of their chairs. They, <laughs> But the reality is, is I, I knew we could do it. Our alumni, you know, if, if you've got a vision and, and um, you, you can execute, they, they will support you. And they have. Um, uh, again, we, we've raised close to the $400 million of our $500 million goal. Uh, our target is to raise that 500 by the end of 2025. I think we're on target to do that. Um, we've already raised over $120 million in scholarships for our students, which is incredible. So again, when you talk about the enrollment cliff and needing to be able to compete against out-of-state schools who come here and throw big money and they're already doing it, um, by us lowering our cost of attendance, we can compete better with the, with those schools. We've also um, raised a, you know about a hundred and um, not quite two hundred million dollars for research, academic pro programs, and faculty support. And you know the remainder really is is around for buildings and facilities, but. Uh, uh, we've really, uh, you know, done a, a really good job, I think, and I and I, I, I'm just so proud of our alumni stepping up. I hear all the time from the other schools, "We wish we had your alumni." I don't know why they give. Uh, I wish our schools would give like that. Um, you know, so it just speaks to what it means to be a vandal, and I'm just very proud of, of both our university and our alums. Yes, me too, definitely. Well, there's been also a little bit of news that might be more regionally centered, but we are do getting a few questions related to Home Depot. Um, why is the University of Idaho um, leasing land to Home Depot, which could maybe potentially negatively impact local businesses? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is a bit frustrating, you know, to me in, in that, um, you know, we've gotten some criticism for, you know, leasing some land to the, where the Home Depot will come here in Moscow. But, you know, you know, frankly, you know, my, my job and, and my focus is 
on what's best for the University of Idaho and um, uh, and its students. And and uh, Home Depot was going to come to Moscow whether we leased land to them or not. So why were the target is beyond me. They were looking at land, you know, throughout the throughout Moscow. Um, uh, they they um, preferred where we were. Uh, we were able to come to a good deal with them where. Uh, they're not only giving us a market lease uh, for our land, um, and it's in it, it aligns with our long-term plans for that that property, which is over by the mall, which is the land we also lease uh, to other uh, to other operators. Um, and uh, they, as part of that agreement, they've agreed to extend A Street uh, in there, so they're making some municipal improvements that normally would not be included with a ground lease. So at the end of the day, it was a pretty good deal for, you know, really for the, for, you know, um, not just the university, but, uh, you know, but for our students and, and for our college of at, um, you know, that money ends up coming into the university, $2.2 million of the life of that lease. And that would have gone to a private, you know, uh, outfit, uh, you know, in Moscow and we still have a home depot. So again, you know, I, I don't see it as my job to prevent competition from coming into town. Um, you know, we have elected officials to do that, city officials and, and county officials. That's their job. My job is to educate people and, and to look out for the best interests of the University of Idaho and our students. And, and that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Um, so, uh, fall enrollment, um, we are already, um, into the, September and so stu students have been back for a little bit. How does our fall enrollment look? It looks pretty good. Um, you know, it, it's uh, our incoming class isn't as large as last year, which was our largest class in our history, but it'll probably be the second largest class. Well, it will be our second largest class, I think, in our history coming in. So the numbers are looking real good and our core enrollment will likely be up over 2%. And and uh, dual enrollment still coming in, so those numbers won't be, you know, um, finalized in total and, until, um, you know, for about a, you know, a few more weeks. But, but what I can say is that, you know, our core is kind of set. Folks are in school now. We're past ten days, and and so our our overall enrollment of that core, um, which would exclude uh, dual enrollment and and um, uh, you know, a non degree seeking students, uh, will be up over two percent. That is amazing. Um, also, we have a question on tight enrollment. At, regarding enrollment, Cliff, what can we do to draw non-resident students um, into the institution? Well, uh, I'm happy to say that for the fourth year in a row, it was just announced yesterday, we are the best value of any public university uh, in the West and number two in the nation, only behind, behind the University of North, North Carolina. So the way we can do it is just be competitive. Um, and, and we want to keep our cost of attendance low and our quality high. And, that, and that's a, that's a winning combination, right? And when you do that, you can attract students, um, over, you know, during, you know, from through the pandemic, actually until this year, you know, we, you know, most of our enrollment growth actually did come from the wooey states. Um, this year has been a bit of a shift, believe it or not. And, and, uh, most of our success came in state. Um, so, uh, you know, I, which I'm, I'm happy for as well. You know, I, I, I take growth wherever we can find it, but my sense is the out of state's going to get even more competitive because again, uh, the de demographics outside of Idaho are worse than they, than, and are going to hit those areas worse, particularly in the Midwest and, and East coast, but also California. And there's a lot of schools that rely real heavily on California right now. And, and, uh, cause California doesn't have enough you know, uh, bandwidth to handle all, all the students who have been going through their system. Well, that's going to change with this enrollment cliff. So you're going to have, you know, those woolly students dry up, and then you're also going to have those institutions that, uh, from out of state that come in, like we see Arizona throwing big money around in Idaho right now, um, and others. As, and the more desperate they get, the more money they're going to throw at it. So we need to stay uh, a best value. We need to keep our costs low and our quality high, and that, that's our strategy. This alumni pointed out that many institutions offer in-state tuition for children of alumni if they're out of state. So have, I don't know if you've heard of such programs, but they're very interested. So something to yeah. think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, it doesn't take long to get residency in Idaho to begin with, you know. So 
and we're already so cheap. I mean, if they're out of state, you know, <laughs> it's it doesn't take a long, a long, long time to uh, to make it pay here at the U of I. So, President Green, I hear there's a book out um, that might uh, draw in some of your expertise and of, of things that you were challenged with when you came into office. Do you want to talk a little bit about about the book? Yeah, sure. You know, we talk a lot here about telling our story, and and we've been through a lot of the first four years here at the U of I. If you think about it, you know, we we were on the brink of insolvency. We've turned that around. We've implemented a, a vandal hybrid model, which is really unique to this university, but helps help straighten out our finances. Um, we've been through a pandemic. We were one of the few universities that opened their own lab during a pandemic and kept our our hospital out of. Uh, probably uniquely in the state and, and you know, uh, of not hitting a crisis standard of care. Um, very few hospitals could say that. Uh, our community did much better, and, and we're really proud of that. And we remained open, we remained solvent. And then we also just experienced, you know, as, as everyone knows, a capital crime on campus, which, you know, shook us, and, and we're still recovering, if, if I'm being totally honest. So, you know, we thought we ought to tell that story, and, and we, you know, we, we were doing that. Um, we're... We, we uh, have a, a co-author, Temple Kenyon, and we've um, uh, written a book about this and about the P3 deal we did on on the um, uh, on the steam plant, which helped kick off a lot of our financial recovery. Um, there's just a lot of things in there that will help university presidents and even managers. And it's just a good story about you know you know how uh, you know the process it, it took to become president, and then all that we did to to uh, write the institution and put us on the path where. We could be a viable uh, institution for competing for something like a University of Phoenix. Um, uh, when you think about it, that's a pretty incredible journey from where we were four years ago. So the book talks about all that. It doesn't talk about the University of Phoenix yet because it's not done. Um, uh, that'll be the next one. And uh, But uh, you know, for now, we, we've got that. And I'll just say that the, um, uh, that the, uh, all the university um, revenues that come from this book. Uh, it's not a Scott Green project, it's a university project. So it's all going to the healing gardens for the, you know, for uh, remembering the lost students. So um, we'd encourage you to go out and buy it. I understand that you're going to send that type of information, a QR code. You can just order the book um, after this in a follow-up email. And we're excited for people to read it. We think it's really good. And most people, you know, uh, that, that have had the opportunity to read it, tell us uh, you know, this is, uh, it's going to be a really useful book for not not only just uh, those in education, but for all managers of all kinds. So, yeah, it's, we will definitely send out that uh, information on how people can get that book um, along with the link to this webinar that, that's going on now. So, uh, we're excited for that. And we're also very proud of, of the accomplishments that, um, that you took on head on um, and we're in a much better place. So, I'll be one of the first people to buy that book. I promise you. Terrific. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah. The uh, there there is a question you brought up the healing gardens um, for the loss of our students. There there was a question regarding um, the King House um, and uh, that it, 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 this particular person said it used to be a two bedroom house when when they were living here on campus. What's the latest on uh, what's going to be happening with the house on King Road? So the the house was donated to us. Um, uh, f frankly, uh, there was uh, a lot of damage done to the house, and and it really was not safe uh, as part of the investigation um, into it. Uh, and all that had to be remediated before we could do anything with it. So uh, we've completed that remediation. We've taken you know, all the personal items out of there and giving the families an opportunity to, to retrieve what they wanted. And we safely disposed of the rest because a lot of it was contaminated. Um, uh, now it's just a matter of, of, you know, tearing down the house at some point. Um, we, we aren't going to do it during the school year. Um, we just have too much going on right now. Uh, so, you know, we deferred that decision. Um, uh, but, you know, probably till at least after this semester is done. Uh, but, the house will come down, um, and the idea is that you know we do want to do something with the land that would benefit you know future students, and and so the idea is that we may use it for low income housing or something like that, but uh, and probably get our College of Art and Architecture students involved in that. Um, 
uh, but we'll see. We, we still have decisions to make on it. Um, and, you know, frankly, um, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that we do what's right for the families and the students. Um, and, and so we're taking our time in, in deciding exactly when and how to do this. Good. Thank you. Um, question regarding um, first generation students and um, there, there, there's been numbers thrown around that 50%, 52% of our students are first generation students. That's something to be very proud of. Um, what do you attribute that success to? I'm sorry, can you say that last part again? What What oh, is oh. the success attributed to by having 52% of the students being first generation students? Yeah, so I don't know this for a fact. Um, Dean Kaler keeps promising some numbers, but I haven't seen them yet. Uh, but I believe a lot of it has to do with our Enroll Idaho program, which is where we travel around the state, high school students, and and talk about the you know the University of Idaho and how you can finance it. Uh, because many students, and particularly first gen, I mean, their parents really don't know much about college or how to go about getting loans or filing, you know, FAFSAs or, uh, you know, uh, you know where Moscow even is and what you can study there and why it's valuable and will it pay off? Because there's a lot of discussion around that. So we travel around to high schools around Idaho. And we talk about all that, including how you can finance it, and we think that that's been really helpful because. We saw a, a real jump after we started doing that. So I suspect, um, even though I can't prove it yet with the data, but I think the data will bear it out that the you know those visits have really paid off. And and uh, we go to all sizes of high school, not just the big ones in the Treasure Valley. You know, uh, you know I've I've been to uh, Tetonia to and and you know uh, up to Sandpoint and and Salmon and uh, you know and around the state. So you know, a potlatch, you know, so, you know, again, it's, and I love it. It's fun. Um, love going to those, those high schools and we have a good time with it. Um, but more importantly, I think the students come away with a desire to learn more about going to college and what they can get out of it. Um, we, I like to say it makes you healthier, wealthier, and wiser. And we talk about how you'll earn more money, $1.2 million on average, even though I think the latest I saw was actually much more than that. It was almost $2 million. Um, uh, on, you know, again, on, on average, uh, healthier, you'll, you'll live nine years longer on average because you're making better decisions and, and you're happier. You're more involved in your community. Yeah. You, you, you know, all the surveys would, would indicate that. So, uh, we have a good story to tell, um, and it's different than the ones that the, you know, the extremists want to tell who are against higher education. So we need to get our story out there as well. And we're doing that. Yes. Our alumni are always asking how they can help and that telling the story, rec recruiting uh, their neighbors, kids, their kids, um, really helping them get to campus to see what what a great opportunity it is for, for a student. Um, we have a question on affirmative action. With all the recent discussion and changes to affirmative action and concerns about legacy admissions, how does the University of Idaho respond to that? Well, we've, we've always... Um, we've always uh, based our decisions on, on folks making, you know, um, hitting our criteria. Um, I'm struggling for the words exactly, but that's it. You know, basically, if you meet our criteria, you're accepted to the University of Idaho. Um, so there's really no other basis for our, for accepting students here. And and since we're a public institution, it's kind of always been that way. Um, other institutions have, have not, um, and, and and I understand why they did things the way they they did. In fact, you know, one of my mentors actually was one of the lawyers for Harvard, uh, you know, arguing that case. Um, uh, so uh, we don't really have to make many adjustments here um, at the U of I, fortunately. Um, but you know, it's going to be a very big change for many institutions, and and um, you know, I don't know how they're going to deal with it or. or you know, and how they're going to adjust, but uh, it's clear that it's clear they're going to have to probably do something in very short order. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we do have time for a few more questions that I wanted to circle back to on University of Phoenix. They keep flowing in a little bit. So um, I think this, we still have about 10 minutes with you. So um, I'm going to ask a few more of those if you don't mind, and then there's time for you at the end. 
Um, so while this alum supports the University of Phoenix um, opportunity, they're concerned about the degradation of the University of Idaho brand. At what point do you see rebranding to U of I online, name to be determined, not uh, unlike Purdue Global Flash Catholic? Yeah, so so many of the issues that have been raised with Purdue and, and Ashford and others is what we call the they didn't have the clean break I was talking to earlier. And and that that's comes from both sides. It could be they've got operators, uh, sellers who were also operators who are still involved, or they don't have their own independent board. They've been merged into the into their, their operations. We're gonna operate as separate institutions and be separately branded, and we still have our own online operation. We have uh, Idaho 360, U of I 360, which is our online operation. Um, we're going to learn a lot from the University of Phoenix, and that affiliation is going to help our online operations. But it doesn't not it's not going to replace it. And we'll build a lot of pathways for our students to the University of Phoenix, and vice versa. You know, you can imagine with 85,000 students a year, if we get a small portion of those to go on to graduate school or with their PhD at the U of I. You've done pretty well. You can imagine with a million alumni out there, uh, they start watching our football games or coming to the Kibbe Dome. A very small proportion of that million, uh, it, you know, could have a huge, a huge impact. So we're pretty excited about that. But I'm, I'm, I'm less worried about brand degradation. We will always be the University of Idaho. They're going to be the University of Phoenix at least for the foreseeable future. And uh, you know, I think once they're part of our, our, um, our, our ecosystem for quite a while. I think you're going to see all these issues around because they were private and, you know, or are private. Uh, but as a not operating as a non for profit with their, all their incentives that are aligned with student success, um, I think you're going to see a lot of those issues go away. Um, they, the, their accreditors think very highly of, they, they've got a two tiered system, HLC. And in the last go round, their creditors actually put them on the higher, uh, on the higher category where they gave them a lot of self, uh, you know, regulation. Um, and it's because they, they, they really like this management team and they like what they see despite what don't read, don't believe everything you read. And, and, you know, they did, they did pay a big fine, uh, but they did not indicate guilt. And they, I think most of them are regretting that now because, uh, you know, again, they've never had to, uh, they've never really been, been, um, uh, convicted of anything. Uh, unlike unlike some of these others who actually had a finding, right? Um, so, uh, you know, again, it's uh, that was a business decision they made. May not have been the best one, but uh, uh, you know, these people, this management team, at least that uh, that we're working with, are are very good people. They've been up here to talk and meet our faculty and our students, and and people have gotten to know them. They've met with the legislators, and they sell themselves. I don't have to once they've met them. It was the same same thing when we met them. That's why I decided. Listen, this is worth going after, and 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 that's what I told our board. These these people are not what, what you know, are not you, you know what you think about when you think about you know, private operators of educational institutions. So wonderful. Um, good. I, I do have one more Phoenix question. Um, the question is if the purchase price is being funded with, um. $500 million debt requiring $70 million of debt service each year, it seems like there would be less money, not more, available for the student experience. Scott, can you walk us through the finance? And yeah, yeah, finance? no, yeah, no, they generate about $150 million of EBITDA every year. <laughs> so you add $20 million, or, you know, $20 million to that because uh, they won't have to pay taxes anymore, and then you then do your math. Uh, there's going to be a substantial amount of money left over for um, reinvestment into the University of Phoenix, which they will need uh, to keep their systems world class, and and for the U of I and and our affiliation. So, uh, you know, the, the numbers are just spectacular, and, and anyone who can't figure, who doesn't see that, you know, um, uh, you know, probably is not in the business world. And and I, I, it's not a criticism. I'm just saying that there's a lot of people who don't get it who just think it's a you know, some toxic asset out there and it's just not, uh, it's an incredibly profitable operation and growing. Um, so, uh, you know, this is probably one of the best opportunities I've seen as a business person, uh, in my career. Uh, so it'd be crazy for us not to consider it. Okay. Good. Getting off the Phoenix topic real quick. Um, I, l I like this question. It's a lot of fun. How do you, you advise students differ from 30 years ago to today and 10 year 
and maybe even 10 years ago in terms of goals and motivation. Yeah. Well, let me start with how they're the same. Um, and then I can talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some of the differences, but, um, you know, what I find, find amazing is, is, um, how similar they are to where, where we were. The, the technology has changed their lives in, in many ways. Um, but they're still, at least at the university of Idaho, they're, they're still quality students. They're still hardworking. Uh, there's a work ethic here. Our, you know, Idaho industry still loves, they love coming and competing for U of I students. We, We've got nearly 300 companies that are going to be on campus, uh, you know, in a couple of weeks at our career fair. It's just, it's unbelievable um, the support that um, our students get and and the demand for them. Uh, and and it's that it's that Idaho work ethic. You know, 70 percent of our students are still Idaho kids, and um, and they bring that and they bring it to their employers when they're done here, together with. The education they've gotten here, which we all know because we've been through it, is first rate um, and has enabled many of us to compete, or, you know, around the world should, if we choose to do that. Um, so, you know, that has not changed, and and I'm proud of that, and I I, I like that. What has changed, and, and I kind of alluded to it, is is they are very technology driven. Um, you know, if it's not on their phone, uh, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so. If you want to recruit students, uh, you got to be on their phone and it can't be an email. It's got to be video, you know, it's just, uh, they live in that world, uh, in, you know, 10 second, 15 second sound bites. I mean, some of the commercials we're putting out, I can't even follow, but, but the kids do, they, you know, they get it and they follow it. Um, uh, I, I would also say they care deeply about, um, about, uh, people and, and the environment more than we did, um. And, and again, I don't mean that as a criticism of us. Uh, you know, I just think that we grew up in a time when, you know, natural resources were abundant and, uh, you know, nobody really had to think about where their water was coming from, you know, and, and that's changed. And these, these young, young adults get that and they care and they want to fix it. They want to conserve what we've got and make sure that we'll, that, you know, they, that we have the same. Uh, opportunities to to go out and hunt and fish and and uh, do what we want to do um, and and they're worried that 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 world might be coming to an end if we don't start making some radical changes about how we manage our our natural resources. So um, I'm just impressed by how they care about each other, uh, about their community and and the planet. And um, I, I think we're in good hands. I do going forward, even though they're they're a different cohort. I think we're in good hands. Excellent. All right. This alum is so excited to come up here for the football games this weekend and is going to the Sticks concert and wants to know, are you going to the Sticks concert? I'll be there. <laughs> you know, interestingly, the Sticks, Sticks was the first band I saw, uh, live concert I saw as, as a kid, you know, because they're one of the few who came through Boise. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Uh, these got these guys got to be pretty old. I mean, they got to be as, at least as old as me, you know, older than me, right? Uh, you know, so uh, it'll, it'll be fun to watch them. But yeah, I'm going, and I can't wait. Uh, looking forward to doing it. And of course, football, Sac State may be the most the toughest game we have this year, other than Cal. And and uh, uh, if we beat them, we're in very very good position, you know, uh, you know, to make a run for a national championship. Uh, uh, but it's it's not going to come easy. Uh, they beat Stanford last week, so we've got our work cut out for us at home. Be there or in square, right? No seats. I don't believe any rumors that you can't find a seat. You can. Um, I think this uh, comment is great to end on, um, but the, uh, this alum could speak to, to many of the alum that are out there today. Just wanted to thank you, President Green, for your leadership and your reasonable, progressive vision for the flagship institution of our state so far during your tenure. And always, always alumni are proud to be a vandal and this person is grateful for the ongoing work um, you are doing for the continued preservation of our great university's reputation and place in the state of Idaho. So I know many uh, would agree with that. So I love, that. love that. Any last words in this last minute together? Well, no, just, I appreciate the, uh... You know, I think we had over 125 uh, alums on at this time. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you like what you heard. And if not, I'm sure you'll write me and tell me, and that's good too. I always love to hear from our alumni. And Amy, I just always have to say, go Vandals.
Go Vandals. Thank you, everybody. And uh, look for another cup of joe with Kathy Aiken. She was our former provost and a wonderful historian in Idaho. And she will be here uh, with us October 17th. So stay tuned on that. And we'll be sending a follow-up email. We couldn't get to all questions, but we hope to send those out to you as well. So thank you, everybody. Really, really uh, happy and proud to have all this alumni here today. So thank you. Go Vandals. Go Vandals.